undergraduate work was working on mosquitoes and looking at the distribution of species diversity within the student housing there. <clears throat> and he was so enthralled with it that he swore he would never work on insects again. So Nee graduated, he did really well. He was, of course, a very important man on campus wandering around. <clears throat> and one of the things I was intrigued with him for was his heavy involvement and his enthusiasm for everything he ever undertook. So we figured he'd be a good addition to our lab. <clears throat> and we brought Nee e. in to CMU. So I asked him, well, what do you think you'd like to do for, uh, for a master's project? And he said, well, when I go back to Nigeria after I'm done with everything, one of the things I'd like to do is set up a wildlife park. And so if I could do something with really big animals, I think, I think that would be great. And I said, fabulous, I've got just the project for you. We're just gonna scale it down a little bit. <laughs> so there had been a paper that had come out suggesting that cats were responsible for killing two billion birds and 20 billion small <clears throat> mammals. Um, so basically, little walking bouts of destruction. Um, we were talking about it, we thought, well, maybe it's not really that they are destroyed, that, it's, that, that there's that many of them killing it. Maybe it depends on where these cats are actually found, whether or not they're likely to be killing these organisms. So we decided that a really interesting project would be to <clears throat> set up cameras in a bunch of different places with different human densities and see if there was a difference in the number of cats that we have using photographic mark recapture. So, prospectus one, Nii likes it, thinks it's a great idea, starts working on it like crazy, It's going through getting a prospectus drafted up, starting to look really good, and then, as my role as, as an associate editor for Journal Mammalogy, I get this paper to send out for review, which basically is doing what we wanted to do with our 40 cameras, only they upscaled it up a little bit and had 1,760 cameras put out over a three-year period. So, we decided, all right, this is not going to work anymore. Prospectus one, crossed off. So, <clears throat> Nii takes it with great aplomb. He's very happy about this. It's not an issue at all. So, <clears throat> I say, but it's all right. I think I have another idea for you. But it'd be working at kind of a remote place. And, you know, I'm not sure if you're going to be, you know, what you think of that. And he said, well, I think we're okay. This was my Boy Scout adventure. So, I figure, okay, he can handle what we're going to do. And it's a really cool project. We're going to look at an invasive species, spotted knapweed, and we're going to use his favorite, in, favorite subject, an insect, to look at it. And Nii was thrilled. <laughs> so we go through, and Nii starts working on prospectus number two. And we're going to submit this to Pierce Cedar Creek to try and get some funding for it. And he's writing, he's got the whole thing developed. We've found our people who are going to be selling us all these things, everything else. <clears throat> and then, I contact one of our alumni at the DNR about trying to get about uh, do we need anything to introduce these little critters, despite they had been introduced into Michigan before. And I found out, yeah, it's completely illegal to introduce anything that might impact this horrifically invasive plant species because the beekeepers like it. They call it star thistle. So they managed to get laws passed that it is illegal to introduce anything that might impact spotted napweed. Me, you took it just fine. <laughs> so, prospectus number three, we have two weeks to finish this. So I say, me, I got a great idea. Let's use this lovely plant. You'll have a lot of fun walking through it. It's very thistly, and the best part, it makes incredibly dense patches so that you're gonna be able to have to walk through this while you're taking all of your data. Me, he was ecstatic. <laughs> so, prospectus three, two weeks, manages to write it, get it submitted, PCCI funded it, thankfully, and Nii was able to be actually happy once again at, in CMU. Now, I do have to say, though, that Nii has been a great individual to work with. Um, he is going to be my first graduate student out of 38 who's going to finish in two years, one field season. So that's an amazing accomplishment in my eyes, and it really, You'll see how he managed to do it because just the, the amount of data he was able to collect was um, <clears throat> just prodigious in one field season. And he's done a really good job of trying to explore what we can do with ramet selection by Europhora cardioi and the Canada thistle and the impacts of infestation. 
So, without further ado, me, it's all yours. Okay. Um, thanks, and thank you all for coming out today. Um, so, I try to describe my advice of that once. I, in an attempt to describe my advice of that once, the first thing I did was to pick up Google. Google of that one thing and I got some really weird pictures that didn't look like that. So it got me curious what would be the best way to describe to describe that one thing. And I had a couple of conversations with some friends and said, why not take a why not take a test to determine which animal fits that best? <laughs> <laughs> so finally I found a really cool website where you could um, when you get asked questions about people and you give the answers, and based on the answers to the questions, they tell you that the animal that best fits um, the person you're interested in describing. So I decided to take the test, and the first question I was asked is, do you consider Brad to be gregarious? I'm like, yeah, I mean, Brad is a little bit popular. Brad is popular, I mean, he enjoys social outings a lot. He's always in the group. Like, okay, that's good, that sounds good. The next question, can you be found in groups, in groups with a lot of females in? Yeah. Like, yeah, that's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of females in the groups, so I'm like, yeah, that's fast. That's kind of cool. The next question was, how would you describe the feeling in the group? And I'm like, hmm, that was kind of a tricky question. But I guess within the group, most of the females do most of the hunting and get, get in the food. And sadly, Brad consumes the food first. <laughs> so what if the meal is poison that a female got? Well, that is <laughs> And the next question was, does Brad have any polarizing accessory? This question kind of threw me off because I really didn't understand it. So I asked for a clue on the website. And I guess the question was trying to relate if Brad was a mammal or if he wasn't a mammal. And one unique feature of mammals is the female usually have the mammary glands. That's the first unique feature of, of mammals. So the mammary glands with the female, so would Brad have any accessory that may relate into any accessory that usually should be found in the female that Brad carries around? And I'm like, hmm, maybe. <laughs> 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 I like that show that the female can't in the same pot. So I was like, hey, that has to be a mango. And, yeah. and the website pointed out that it could be one of these 12 species. And I'm like, wow, oh, okay. So it could be anything from a lion to a zebra to a dolphin to a dog, or maybe even to a woman. And I'm like, wow. Would there be a way to differentiate these animals and probably find one that fits that the most? And I said, hmm, what features could I look at to differentiate these animals? And apparently, some of the animals lose their hair, and some <laughs> don't. So based on that, I classify these animals into two groups. The first, that do not lose their hair, and the second, that do, that do lose their hair. I'm like, wait a minute, bad? I'm <laughs> 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 like, yay, bad is a dolphin. Definitely, the thing is, the answer was sitting right in front of me in books all in books all in one fifty two, and I never really saw it. So could that personality match a dolphin um, was the question. Dolphins are extremely intelligent animals, which that apparently is extremely intelligent. Um, dolphins are also best at helping others at achieving the goal, which is something that is really great in. Dolphins are also really great mentors and have been observed to teach their young how to use important tools. Um, that is also a really great mentor. And one thing about that, most of you should know, it really answers the question directly, instead it allows you to figure it out. And the environment that it creates in the lab and the people around it is an harmonious and a really pleasing environment. So I would like to invite you all to go on a tail with a dolphin, <laughs> my tail on a dolphin, with a dolphin for the last about two years. So let's get started with the um, pieces. Um, so the breakup and the breakup of the supercontinent and the drifting away of the fragments resulted in geographic isolation, which prevented species from expanding their range and accounts for most of the patterns of biogeography we observe in the world today. However, major advances in global trade and transportation have allowed species to expand their ranges and invade new habitats. Um, so the figure on the left shows the number of flights between different international airports of the world, which 
not. So today, species ranging from microorganisms, plants, and animals move across the globe in conjunction with global trade and transportation, the result of which is an increased presence of non-native species in different regions of the world. Um, however, non-native species get our attention when they inflict ecological and economic harm in the environment they usually found in, at which point they are described to be as 